In the 18th century, the Baron Munchausen, shown here riding a cannonball, once leapt over a nine-foot-tall hedge with a horse balanced upon his head and another completely different horse tucked under his arm. If you find that difficult to believe, you're on the right track. The Baron Munchausen was a hoax, and his stories were complete fiction. Today, Baron Munchausen lends his name to Munchausen Syndrome, one type of factitious disorder, where people exaggerate, feign, or produce illnesses. Munchausen Syndrome gets its name from the lies that are involved, and yet, despite these falsehoods, the problems caused are very real, like the time a boy forced an airplane to land by faking a severe asthma attack. When taken to such extremes, faking sicknesses can become a sickness. But where exactly is that line? Allow me to explain. The spectrum of factitious and related disorders is complicated, but here is a basic look. Today, we are focused on the left side of this chart. In the United States, those two boxes alone accounted for an estimated 30 to 60 billion dollars of unneeded medical care over the course of 30 years. So, exaggerating the extent of or pretending to have an illness is more common than it may seem, which makes sense because the general idea is to not get caught. Many of you watching right now have done a comparatively mild version of this, most likely to avoid school or work. It's difficult to know exactly how often this occurs, but 38% of people in one 2015 survey admitted to calling in sick to work when they were feeling fine, and that's just the people who admitted to it. In more extreme cases, con artists will fake an illness to get drugs or money, and accused criminals will sometimes do it in an attempt to receive less harsh penalties. When this is done with such secondary gains in mind, it is called malingering. Malingering also shows up in lawsuits. For example, people might exaggerate or fake an injury. In one case, reported in Dr. Feldman's Playing Sick, a man sued after slipping on a wet floor, claiming he'd gone mute after hitting his head. Suspicions mounted when it was revealed that he had landed on his butt and not his head during the incident. His legal team quit the case as a result of suspicion that a butt blow would not stop speech. Then, after his voice came back miraculously, he hired another legal team, this time claiming to have total amnesia from the same accident. It wasn't until someone questioned his green card status that he suddenly remembered everything. But at some point, we cross a line where things go from head shaking to heartbreaking as things spiral out of control. The box labeled factitious illness, including Munchausen, is reserved for when playing sick is taken to a pathological extreme that interferes with living life. In these cases, the motivation is non-material, usually involving the pursuit of nurturance, sympathy, control, or the expression of rage. In Munchausen syndrome, which is the most severe factitious illness, playing the role of a patient becomes a full-time job, moving from hospital to hospital to keep up the illusion, and upping the gamble by telling stranger and stranger fictions. When the stories get sufficiently strange enough, we enter the territory of Pseudologia Fantastica, which is behavior characterized by gratuitously lying about elaborate scenarios that make their lives seem interesting in an unbelievable way, both figuratively and literally. This can include factitious victimization, I'm being stalked. By nobody. Factitious heroism, I saved my pet from a fire. That I started or never happened. Factitious bereavement, I'm mourning a loved one who never existed. And sometimes elements of all three. And while it might be tempting to outright dismiss these cases because of the unpleasant deception taking place, it is not as simple as calling them out on a lie for two reasons. Firstly, Munchausen sufferers go much further than malingerers because they often produce a legitimate problem by intentionally causing self-harm. This ailment production takes many forms, sometimes injections. Insulin, blood, milk, and even the downright bizarre like parrot excrement have all been injected to produce symptoms. Sometimes, these patients even convince doctors that they are in need of dangerous surgeries, occasionally having parts removed that were not diseased. In multiple cases, patients have faked endocrine diseases so convincingly that doctors removed their healthy adrenal glands, creating a real condition due to missing those glands that required a lifetime of medical care. The second reason why these people shouldn't be dismissed as outright fakers is that Munchausen syndrome is considered a mental illness, which genuinely requires therapy. The physical ailments that a Munchausen sufferer has may have been self-inflicted, but the mental ailments, which are the root cause, stem from somewhere else, oftentimes involving depression or borderline personality disorder. 
Malingering, by contrast, is not considered to be a mental illness, and neither is Munchausen by proxy, which despite the similar name is another situation altogether. Munchausen by proxy occurs when a caretaker produces factitious symptoms in someone in their charge, usually children, pets, or the elderly. It usually takes the form of carefully planned, secretive abuse in which children are made sick so that the caretaker can meet a plethora of psychological needs, often motivated by a desire to star in the role of a selfless caregiver. One estimate, and again this is only an estimate, charges that a full 1% of asthma cases in children are faked by adult caretakers. Fevers, seizures, poisoning, rashes, and infections are also commonly introduced by the perpetrators. And that's just the tip of a very troubling iceberg. In fact, this behavior is ultimately fatal to the victim anywhere from 6 to 9 to 31 percent of the time, due to the escalation of severity of problems introduced by the perpetrator. The reason Munchausen by proxy is not considered a mental illness, while Munchausen syndrome is, is for the same reason that a suicide attempt is primarily treated psychiatrically, while a homicide attempt is primarily treated legally. Although there is some disagreement on this part, especially since in 10 to 25 percent of cases of MBP, the perpetrators also feign illness in themselves, so there is some overlap. In fact, this entire topic contains a level of disagreement, partly due to the patients being seen as insufferable by physicians and the public. Which is understandable to an extent. I certainly wouldn't want to operate on a person who later turned out to not need the surgery all along. And this attitude unfortunately means that, in the United States, there have been a total of zero research dollars awarded to study Munchausen cases. But if we can separate ourselves from the somewhat appropriate anger response for a moment, we can still find reasons to treat this problem as a serious issue deserving of research. The first is the aforementioned economic impact, the billions of dollars of U.S. funds spent on unnecessary medicine. Dr. James C. Hamilton notes that the estimates of cost would place factitious illness behavior problems in the same league as medical problems like Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, liver damage, ovarian and cervical cancers, and epilepsy. This could be reduced if we invest in preventative study. Second is the psychological toll on others. A term coined by Dr. Feldman is Munchausen by Internet which can refer to masquerading online as someone with a problem in order to gain sympathy and support from online communities like cancer survivor chat rooms. The internet makes it easy to copy or fake medical records, even by googling the medical images and claiming them as your own. When the ruse is figured out and the community members discover that the sacrificed time, money, and emotional investment went to a sham, they become less willing to help people in the future who actually need it. And of course, this is not a simple medical malady to fight. It's a complicated issue. But as Dr. Hamilton notes, there is no organized constituency that is invested in promoting the understanding of factitious disorder. But promoting this understanding is important. Many of the cases I have read contain instances of patients, doctors, and affected loved ones who didn't even know that there was a name for the factitious illness problems that they were experiencing, let alone what steps should be taken to handle such a situation. So let's change that. It's time that we take this problem seriously and invest in understanding why and how people fake illnesses to the point that they become ill. I highly recommend the book Playing Sick. It gives insight into an otherwise invisible problem, one that should not be ignored. And special thanks to Dr. Feldman himself. I contacted him after I fell in love with his book and he was gracious enough to link me to some very helpful resources from his incomparable expertise in the area.